Welcome to Forward Obsessed, where we talk to breakthrough business leaders and rising entrepreneurs about their journeys, origin stories, and aha moments. Progress, pitfalls, and pivots. Business is a roller coaster, folks. Strap in, there's only one direction, and it's forward. Hosted by Pete Senna and David Salinas. Well, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Ari Santiago, for joining us today as our guest on Forward Obsessed. We're just super, super excited to have you, man. Welcome. Dude, thank you guys so much for having me on. Like, I'm pumped and uh, can't wait to see what you guys have in store. Awesome. Well, first and foremost, um, just because you're a first-time guest here on, on Forward Obsessed, just to give you a little bit of what we're going to dig into today. So um, we're going to first just tell the, the audience a little bit about who you are and your background, and then we're going to go on a journey. And, you know, one of the things I love about Ari, just for the, the audience listening now and in the future, you know, Dave and I met Ari and we've just loved watching how he's been shaping just how companies think about technology and how companies, you know, push the bounds of what's possible through technology um, as founder and CEO of his company, IT Direct. So Ari, you're a tried and true entrepreneur. You, you started your first business, I think, at the age of 14, if I recall correctly. So yeah. tell the audience a little bit about you. Sure. Yeah. I mean, listen, so my first, like, I'll call it official business, you know, someone that I think uh, went to the Secretary of State's office or got driven because I was 14. Uh, was that first business, SNS Computing, uh, that was 1991, I think. We were uh, building and selling computers back at a time when that was something you could reasonably do uh, and not, not competing, uh, you know, with, uh, with the Dells of the world. Um, but anyway, yeah, I do. But, you know, it's been entrepreneurship and business has just been something that's, I think, been in my blood from the very beginning. You know, I often joke that my first business was either that computer building business or it was buying a bazooka joe bubblegum from the uh, drugstore uh, bishop's corner on my bike in boxes and then selling individual pieces at school so um you know it's just been kind of something that i've always been interested in always wanted to do and and i, I just love it you know and uh, every it's different challenges at uh, seven eight years old uh, and 14 and 43 where i am now but um, but challenges nonetheless, and, you know, super fun to just be able to kind of look at needs and demands that customers have out there and find new and innovative ways to, uh, to make them happen. That's awesome. So, you know, one of the things that I, I loved, I've been on a couple of panels with Ari as well, team, and, you know, one of the things that was super exciting um, was just hearing, like, the path, you know, to sort of stardom, to be founder and CEO, wasn't the, the smoothest sailing path for you in some cases, right? So maybe you can talk a little bit about just, that path and that journey and just some of the, the bumps in the road that got you there. Sure. Yeah. No, listen, I mean, I, I've been really fortunate to know a lot of different uh, entrepreneurs and business people, yourselves included. Uh, and I don't think I know anybody who's, uh, who's co whose course was a straight line up. Um, and mine was certainly uh, no exception to that. Um, I mean, listen, so I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, you know, my, my kind of journey, at least on the technology side and where I am today, really started kind of serendipitously. You know, I was uh, 13 years old. I was uh, skiing in Vermont and uh, just made one wrong turn, slipped on some ice, was knocked unconscious, slid a few hundred yards into some snowmaking equipment uh, and was left paralyzed from the waist down. Mm -hmm. And so I woke up uh, 10 days later, uh, you know, in Hartford Hospital intensive care unit. Um, literally not knowing where I was. The last thing I remembered was showing up at a ski mountain. And I, it's funny, the last thing you remember, I remember uh, walking in, I had a brand new pair of Dina Star verticals. It was the second day I was skiing on them. And back in those days for like a quarter or a nickel or a dime, you'd like lock your skis up outside. And that was not something I really ever did, but these skis were brand new. And I remember my parents being like, take care of these skis, you know? And I remember going and putting them on a rack and there was nowhere to lock them up. And we were walking into the lodge to get ready to go on the mountain. And I just remember turning one of my friends with me and being like, are my skis going to be safe? And he's like, yeah, man, don't worry about it. And I just remember walking in the door to the lodge. And then the next thing I remember, it's 10 days later, it's dark. I open my eyes. I'm in immense pain. I can't feel my legs. I hear beeping and I'm getting wheeled out of intensive care uh, into at the time pediatric unit. And I'm literally like, what the fuck is going on? You know, just like totally um, shocked. And I went from, you know, a kid who was, uh, you know, four season athlete, you know, baseball, soccer, basketball, swimming. Um, and now all of a sudden I'm lying in bed, staring at the ceiling, being like, whoa, you know, life is definitely going to be a little bit different now. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of went through that process, you know, went rehabbed and kind of got out of there and 
had to start my life, you know, kind of all over again, right? Uh, my dreams, which probably weren't going to happen, of being a starting baseball player for the Boston Red Sox, those were clearly dashed, um, and I had to figure out something new to do. And I was just super fortunate to have a family that was unbelievably supportive and encouraging. And my mom had a friend um, that was actually an anesthesiologist, I want to say, but also kind of like was into computers. And, and you guys got to remember now, it's kind of hard to imagine. But back then, computers weren't anything like that they were today. I mean, this is pre-Windows. Um, and so it was like most offices, especially small offices, had a couple computers, right? Um, there was word processing departments, right? Not everyone did their own word processing. Um, and so this, like having this computer that you would have was a new thing. And um, he's, and I was super bored at the hospital. And he was like, do you want me to bring you this computer? And you could play with it. And that's what I did. And I sort of developed, realized I had an aptitude for it. And that aptitude kind of turned into really a passion for technology that I didn't, didn't know that much about. And that really kind of set me on a bit of a, of a winding path. Um, so, I mean, you know, the, my, my kind of career in computers started, you know, listen, my mom was a dentist and my father was an attorney. So, and, and very successful in their own rights. My mom had her own practice. My dad was a partner in a Hartford law firm. Um, so successful for sure. Uh, but we never got like allowance or anything like that. You know, growing up, we used to have like what I would call rent uh, was like our chores. And it was like normal stuff, you know, uh, make your bed, clear the table, set the table, take out the trash, you know, all that stuff you do like around the house to help out that, you know, we didn't get any, you know, we didn't get paid for it all. Uh, and so we had no money. And if we wanted to have money to do stuff, we'd have to do extra stuff. And um, kind of the general rule was like, if you went to my mom's office or whatever, you'd get paid one half your age per hour. So if I was eight years old and I went there to like clean up or whatever, I get four bucks an hour. You know, my dad would let us like shine his shoes and they were like nice. You know, sometimes my dad, there were shoes probably didn't need shining all the time, but I think I was getting 50 cents uh, a shoe. Uh, my brothers later on were getting like double, triple that. So that was kind of disappointing. Um, but you know, inflation. <laughs> um, so, you know, there was a, uh, there was stuff like that. Um, I used to get, I used to babysit my little brother. So I'm the oldest of four. I think I got a quarter an hour per kid just like slave labor wages. Um, and so, you know, here we go kind of getting back out of the hospital and I come back and I think to myself, well, I'm fucking getting allowance now. You know what I mean? Like I used to, cause I used to caddy at the Hartford golf club. I sometimes, you know, help my buddies mow lawns or, or deliver newspapers to try and make extra cash. And I'm thinking, clearly I'm not doing any of that. So I'm going to get on the, get on the company dole here, you know? And uh, I was disabused of that pretty quickly. And my parents were like, nope you better figure out how you're going to do it. And here I am now. So I was 13 when I got hurt, but turned 14 in the hospital. So it was really close to my birthday. And, um, and I'm like, Whoa, you know, what am I going to do? And after a little bit of a cry, my mom was like, you're going to have to figure it out because your life is, this is your life now. And she's like, what do you think you could do? I remember sitting in the dining room. I'll never forget. And, um, and I was like, I don't know what I could do. You know, just, you know, when you get on yourself, like, and as an entrepreneur, this probably happens more often than people think you're just like, I don't know how I'm going to do it. Like the mountain seems insurmountable. And I just remember my mom being like, there's gotta be a path, you know, let's think about what we could do. There's a, there's a solution here. And she was like, you know, what about computers? You know, you've really gotten good at this computer thing. And, um, she was like, what about teaching people how to use computers? And my 14 year old brain was like, teach people how to use computers. I just taught myself how to program in basic and write batch files and all this stuff in like two and a half months. Who, who fucking needs instructions on how to use a computer? You know, it was just like, felt like teaching someone how to breathe. Obviously when you're good at something or it just comes naturally, you don't always uh, realize that. And so I was like, all right, let me look into that. And I did some research and I found out they do pay people uh, to learn how to use computers. And relative to my $4 an hour, or I guess at that time, seven bucks an hour, working at my mom's office, this was like pretty good money. And so, um, I decided I was going to try and do that. And so I looked into uh, who, how I could do that. And so, uh, you know, networking as we do, people that you know. My grandfather knew a guy who had retired and wanted to write like a book. And he had bought a Mac. Um, and despite what people think, he couldn't figure out how to use it. And so he was like, maybe you could come over. Hey, I read your article earlier today, Pete. I hope we're going to get to that. That was an amazing uh, Microsoft Apple uh, comparison article, solid uh, analysis. Anyway, so he has me come over um, to his house to do teaching. Again, I can't drive. So, um, so I'm going to go over there and uh, teach him how to do it. And I am, I am uh, determined that I'm going to charge this guy uh, $10 an hour, I think it was, or $15 an hour. Um, 
to, to, to teach them how to use the computer. I think it was 10. And that's like an a, amazing amount of money in 1991 for, you know, a 14 year old, you know what I mean? Um, so I go up there, I'm teaching him how to do it. I spend two hours there, you know, teaching him through it. And on the way out the door, he gives me a 50. And I was like, damn, I love this. You know? Yeah, dude, for real. I mean, think about this. I used to lug, I used to, I used to, I used to lug 18, you know, I used to lug golf, uh, golf clubs in a bag for like three and a half hours across an entire golf course for like 15 bucks. And in two hours, sitting in the guy's house where his wife was giving me cookies and lemonade, I just got 50 bucks. I mean, so I was like, yeah, um, except, you know, the Windows 95 registry and you gave me <laughs> nice. um, and, and, you know, here's a good lesson, though, I think from entrepreneurs, which is don't chase the money. Cause I, I got really excited about the money, but I got pretty unexcited about the job right quick. And the next time I went back, um, he just hadn't really progressed and it was super frustrating. And I remember, um, one of the things he struggled with was like how to, how the word processing worked. And so he would tell me, Hey, every time I'm typing, when I get to the end of the first page, it deletes the top of the page. And so he, I was like, I was like, well, show me how that works. So we were like, type, 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 type. And he gets to the bottom of the page, like, and it would scroll. And he's like, see, it's gone. And I'm like, no, no. And then I would hit the up arrow and he's like, no, you lost the bottom. And I was, you know, it was just like, you know, and I would like scroll down. He like looked at the top of the screen, like, where is it going? You know? Um, and I just, after that second session, I'm like teaching, not for me, you know? Um, and so I decided that wasn't going to be it. And it just wasn't worth it to me. It's about 14. I had a house and all that stuff, but it just wasn't worth it to me to chase the money. Love the payday. Didn't love the job. I was like, there's gotta be something I can do that I can enjoy doing as much as I enjoy getting paid for doing. Um, and to be honest with you, like, that's just something. What's that? Sorry. So just so you know, uh, we call out to our editor and I, if I go like this and I say, clip that, that's going to be a clip for you. Oh, gotcha all these great bites and uh it's uh it's something that we do because we're going to turn this into micro content because you're right it's a great lesson and someone may not have the fortune of listening to this hour-long podcast but they may catch a 30 second snippet of what yeah yeah, yeah. Have, which is awesome yeah, that yeah. That, that's a that's a great segue so all right if you're comfortable with it of course only is i want to dig a little bit into your motivation and your drive you know a lot of people I see a lot of people now where the most trivial thing happens to them. They, they crack their phone and they're crying and, and life has to stop, right? You had a life altering accident that clearly not only did it catalyze your journey into IT and, and becoming a successful entrepreneur, which you are today and in many, many rights and merits, but I want to sort of get into that psychology and understand sort of before the accident, were you always this driven? Were you always this motivated? And clearly you played multiple sports, but you know, I, I think a lot about, there's a great book, uh, Drive, if you haven't read it, by Daniel Pink. And he says, you know, what drives people is not extrinsic motivation. It's not the money that we chase, as you said. It's intrinsic motiva motivations. He says, it's purpose, autonomy, mastery, right? Clearly, you mastered computers <laughs> over the past 20 plus years. But before the accident, after the accident, you know, you made a clear choice. And I want you to share that with the audience. You made the choice to move forward, right? We talk about being forward obsessed here on this episode, right? You made the cho choice to say, you know what? Let me not complain. And luckily you had the fortune of your parents clearly to give you great advice and say, all right, you're going to just have to figure this out. I want to sort of talk to the to young people listening to this now in the future that don't know what they want to do, that don't know what their passion is, that don't know how to take it to the next level. So take me through your, your mental patterns on that back then and even today, because I think it's so, it's so needed to be heard now. Yeah, man, I think a really tough question because I don't have like a, you know, I don't have like a secret, like there isn't, you know, I don't know, you know, it's, it's sort of like, uh, I think people, you know, sort of say like in business, you know, how do you do it? What's the secret? What's the secret? And a lot of times I feel like the secret is looking for the shortcut that just doesn't exist. You know, it's like, what's the secret to being fit, eating right and fucking working out, man. Like, it's just not that hard. It's just hard to do it consistently. And I think for me, the idea is you asked about the motivation pre and post. And I think, the motivation's always been the same. I just want to like 
do stuff that makes me happy. And I just want to make an impact. You know, I want to make an impact that's going to leave something behind that's greater than myself. And I've always felt that way. You know, I've always thought about just doing something that's going to make an impact on everybody around me all the time. It's just, it's just who I am and what I've been. And there's been multiple times in my life, clearly the most obvious one, is the accident, but like there's been others. And I think most people, if they take a step back and they think about their life, they've had challenges, you know what I mean? And, you know, people, I, I've been super fortunate that my parents have been married and together and a good influence on me my whole life. A lot of people don't have that. You know, they had single parents or they've been through divorce or some people have substance abuse in their family, either substance abuse of themselves or, and, and like, or substance abuse of a, of a parent or a sibling, you know, those are like really, really tough challenges. And I look at those and say, man, sometimes those are even harder. At least the thing that happened happened to me. So I'm in the driver's seat. I get to control how I respond and how I react. Imagine if like one of my parents had a substance abuse problem or my brother, one of my brothers who I love had a substance abuse problem or a mental health challenge. Like that's even harder because I don't have control over it, but we all have these challenges and these challenges come up over and over in life. And I just think the most important thing and what I love about your forward obsessed name is the most important thing is we just need to keep moving forward. And if we just think one step at a time, and we just keep taking the next step and the next step and the next step, eventually shit just gets better. And yeah. that's what it's all about. You know, at least let that's my take. Let, Ari, let me ask you a question. I, I do want to go back to that though, because at, at least for me, I think everybody, you're right. Everybody has trauma. Um, my therapist once told me that people have little T and big T. Most people go throughout the, their life with lots of little T. People like yourself and I have had big T happen right? Um, mine was the death, the, the death and loss of loved ones, you know, being around in a tough city, seeing a lot of things that you're not supposed to see when you're really young. Yours was your accident. In hindsight, when I look back at my father's advice and the way that he treated me when I had my, my situations, at initially, I was, uh, I, it, it made me angry. I, I, pushed, I pushed against it. In my later years, I gained these incredible, valuable insights and lessons from it because I was able to see what he was trying to do. Now, my father was a blue collar immigrant from South America who would just say like, if, if, if I had gotten into the accident, he would say, oh, that's bullshit. You don't need your legs, don't worry about it. And I would literally just be like, okay, dad, great, thank you. Um, and yeah, but David, that's- Your, that, your parents yeah. were very, uh, they were highly educated, they were professional. When they gave you the advice that you just have to do what you have to do, you're gonna to have to figure it out. Did you immediately snap into it and say, I got this? Or, did, or was that something that you learned? Because I don't want the people to think that everybody just sort of has that gift of saying, I got it, okay, let's go. No, well, here's the thing is, you know, I'm not a psychologist. Let me tell you my story and then I'll tell you what I think, right? So, I mean, I think here, here's the deal, right? It was hard and it sucked and I cried and I was mad and I went through all the stages, denial, is it going to come back? You know, um, you know, I remember like having, you know, kind of like, I mean, now it feels like false hope, but having hope, right? They said, hey, you know, up until, I don't remember how many weeks or days or whatever it was, like, you know, this could bounce back, it could whatever, whatever. And then I held on to that hope. And then as days went by, and nothing came back and then it started to set in and then I was like you know felt bad for myself and you know why me and like I like literally made a mental list of all the people in the world that I knew that deserved it more than me like think about how shitty that is you know uh, how could this happen to me you know like I went through all that you know for sure dark dark places when you when you're on pain medication, you can't sleep, you're stuck in the hospital bed. And I was super fortunate more than many to have so many visitors, but there's still so many hours you're alone. Um, and all you have is time to think because you literally can't get out of bed. Nothing you knew how to do, basically, you could do anymore. You know, getting dressed, fucking hard. Getting out of bed, impossible. You know, like, just think about learning the basic things in life mm. from the beginning. Yeah. It sucks, dude. Yeah, you no. can't fucking reach the cereal, you know? It sucks. So, but it wasn't that easy. And to your point, you know, my, you know, my, my, my parents got where they got through hard work and dedication. You know, my dad, you know, uh, you know, grew up in, in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, I didn't have a, the, the easiest life uh, that I had, you know, um, 
And, you know, he went to school to be an engineer and realized after getting an engineering degree, being married to um, my, my mom, who had just finished dental school, they had two kids while she was in dental school. Then he decides, I don't want to be an engineer anymore and saw a way to put himself with two kids and a wife just starting a new career, put himself through a JD MBA to yeah. change careers. How many people would do that? You know, um, when you still have, you know, your loans from, from engineering school. So, so, I mean, that's, so, you know, that was kind of in the family, but I, I'll tell you, this is something that, that just, I remember, you know, we were, I was at uh, rehabbing at Newington children's hospital and uh, I had had a really tough day and I, I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I used to have hours of PT hours of OT. They'd be like teaching me how to like get from the bed into the wheelchair, teaching me how to like get dressed again, like just basic life stuff. And I just had a tough day. I was tired and I was just fucking done. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I am just, I am just, I am just done. And I just wanted to give up. And, um, you know, my dad came in and um, I was probably crying and certainly feeling sorry for myself and just telling him, I'm done. I quit. I don't want to do this anymore. And he probably was like trying to talk to me out of it. And you know how kids can get whatever. I was just like, no, this is my way. I'm done. And he just like grabbed me by the shirt and he like looked me in the eye and he was like, Ari, your accident didn't fucking kill you. Don't let your attitude kill you. Mm. And, and I'll tell you what, I got so mad. I got goosebumps with that, man. That's, I got yeah. so mad. I was like, I'm going to do it just to fucking show him he's wrong. That's, that's like my attitude. Yeah. I was just pissed. And, but it was the right thing to say. And it was the right thing to do. And it was the right way to like shake me out of that, like that rut I was in that was getting me nowhere, Amazing. you know? All right, I, I, I just want to first of all say thank you for, for, for allowing me to bring you there because I think the important thing that people need to, to understand is people get into these ruts, right? I, that rut that you described, that dark place, is a place that I've been in my life, right? And I, and I think that when you go there and it's so deep and it's so dark, you have a choice. You can stay down there. You can live down there. You can learn to love it down there. You can fight back up. I made the decision, it sounds like you made that exact same decision that when you when you turned around and you went up, you spent your time down there and now you've come up, that gave you the that gave you the strength and and probably the muscle memory to make sure that any other issue that came up in life from that point forward never you never spent that much time down there. And I think that's the lesson that I like to give people, which is listen, fucked up shit happens. Take a day, you know, absorb it, scream, do what you gotta do. But the next day, it's time to go. It's time to go. There's no reason to stay in that dark place. Don't love it down there. Don't embrace it. Don't hug it. It's, it's not worth it because things can change. So on that, I want to pivot us now because all of a sudden, you've got that. Then all of a sudden, I'm going to fast forward through your life. You've got all these different jobs, tech, you know, you've done all these different things to make money. Then you go to law school. And then you pivot out of that. Walk us through that for a little bit. Yeah. So I never actually made it to law school. Thank God. Okay. Um, but I, you know, I was, I was on my way, you know, I, I'm the oldest kid. My dad was a lawyer. I just thought that's what I was supposed to do. I came from a family that in my mind, it was like, you go to high school, you go to college, you get an advanced degree and like, boom, that's life, you know, dentists and lawyers and wow, doctors it, that, that was just all around me. Um, that and that's what I, is that, like my father always told me, he's like, there's two jobs in the world, doctors and lawyers. I, I do. I don't know. I, I think, you know, it comes from a place that, you know, m my mom's family, not that many generations ago was immigrants from Eastern Europe. And they just believe deeply that education is the way to advancement. And so that's, you know, where it was. Um, but that's just what I felt. And that's what I saw around me. And that's just what I thought I had to do. And so, and, and I also, by the way, another good lesson that's going to probably come out of this is I really loved computers. And yeah. somehow I got the idea that you had to, you shouldn't go to work for your hobby because then what's going to make you happy in life? How fucked Ooh. up is that? You know? Um, and so I was like, all right, well, I can't, I can't, do computers for work because then I won't have a hobby. So let me go be a lawyer and be an unhappy lawyer. And then I'll have a good hobby on the side. That's some messed up thinking. So I, so I went to school to do that. And um, so, you know, I went to, I'm at Tufts and um, I'm at my fraternity house and, you know, as, uh, as kids in college might do, we were having a little uh, marijuana sesh and we were just having a conversation and talking about what are we going to do after school? And I will never forget 
all these guys were like pumped about what they were going to do next. Oh, I'm going to be an engineer and do this. I can't wait to go to medical school. I can't wait to do this. Like, like excited. And it was my turn. And all I could muster to say was, I don't want to be here anymore. Mm. I don't want to be here anymore. And that was it. I was like, I'm out. And I just decided, what am I going to do to get out of this as quickly as possible? And um, I had a lot of credits from uh, high school AP, and I took some classes at Trinity College when I was in high school. And so I looked at my credit requirements, and I realized, hey, if I stack up my major, uh, I could be done in one more semester, so second semester junior year. So I went to the school, uh, dean or whatever, and I said, Here, here's my plan to graduate, um, and I want to do this and execute. And they were like, well, that sounds good, except for one thing. We have this eight semester rule. And we don't feel like you could really represent Tufts and be a Tufts graduate if you don't spend eight semesters here. And I didn't like that. I was like, I thought my job here was to meet my credit requirements so I can earn this degree. And the amount of time I got to spend here, what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we had a difference of opinion on that. Um, I felt that it was a money grab. They felt it was something else. I said, well, here's the deal. We execute on my plan or I'm never coming back. And they were like, we'll see what your parents say. And I'm like, I guess we will. And I've never been back. You see, and interestingly enough, I just want to pivot in for, the, for one second. That same issue still is around today, which is proof that this fucking product called education has not been fixed. It is one single thing. It is like one industry that everyone has had a problem with one product that costs so much money that doesn't have to innovate, doesn't have to change, doesn't have to do anything. And it just keeps getting funded. It just keeps sucking people's money out and it's not helping people. It's not actually making the, the change that we need in society. So I, thank you for I, that out. Uh, David, I completely agree. It's funny. Just earlier today, I was reading an article that somebody wrote on LinkedIn that was really talking about how old brands can get rejuvenated and how new brands can go wrong. And it was just talking about really a focus on innovation and a focus on customer. I don't know if you guys heard of it. It was like uh, this Microsoft Apple article, this guy like Pete Sen Sina, Sienna. I, I, anyway, anyway, it's pretty good. You guys should look it up. Uh, was but it was. Is that the wrestler? I get that. Yeah, one. yeah. Maybe that's what it was. And uh, it was just this really well written article. Seriously, Pete, it was awesome. And right. and I think that it applies in reverse, right? That was about how Microsoft has recaptured because they realized where they went wrong and, and, and Apple the other way. And I've been joking about Apple the whole time. I'm like, wow, the innovation from Apple is a quarter inch in the screen size. I mean, it's like, this is just ridiculous. Um, and they've lost the focus on the customer. And to your point, David, and I believe this for a long time, that education, the goal of education came to get money from students as opposed to help the life of students be better. And yeah. It's just not right, and uh, and it's ripe for innovation, um, and that anyway. So that's where it was. So I got off that that hobby horse, and mm -hmm. I left, um, and it was really helpful to me to, to follow what I wanted to do. I ended up getting into like a bit of a sales role, um, and sort of did that for a while, and that was also really helpful. Like every, I'll say this to young people that are listening, you know, one of the things that's awesome about being young is. Aside from like, you know, getting hooked on drugs and staying in the dark place we talked about earlier, there are no bad choices. Do anything. You think you want to be an artist? Go be an artist. You think you want to go into account, like whatever you think you want to do, do it. Because you, there are so many reboots when you're 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Like, like you can reboot so many times and, you and you don't, you don't you could, yes, 100,000 hundred thousand percent uh, you can reboot anytime there's no doubt i just think that sometimes if you if you wait too long and i was just having this conversation with someone i'm going to keep this a little bit anonymous because i don't want to out them but you know someone that was close to me asked me for some career advice and they're in a problem because they've built a life around the salary that they have and now they're not the only one depending on this salary and they're super unhappy and they are now stuck changing because they can only change to something that will pay them similar to what they have, but they're so far advanced in what they have. Anything you restart, you're going to have to st take a step back. And so they, you know, you don't have those, you don't have those challenges, right? You don't have a wife and kids and a mortgage when you're, you know, usually when you're, when you're 22. So anyway, point being, I want to, I want to go into that for a second. Cause you, you, sure. I don't want to lose something you said, which really struck me. And I just, I think the audience is going to just really want to know the answer to what I'm about to ask you. So Please. the first thing here is I'm a firm believer that, 
when I meet entrepreneurs, and again, I have the, the fortune and blessing to, to be on with two great ones right here, one of which is my partner in many things with Dave. And, and Ari, it's, I'm a firm believer that entrepreneurs violently disagree. And what I mean by that specifically is you violently disagreed with the education system and you said, fuck it, right? And I'm also a firm believer that true entrepreneurs, not entrepreneurs, but I'm a firm believer that true entrepreneurs endure. They, they're resilient. They, they find their way through, through struggles, whether it be personal struggles, business struggles. Now, literally, for those that are only listening, can't see the video, Ari is wearing a unicorn on his shirt today. Um, there's a cool, cool story on that, which doesn't matter right at this moment. But Ari, you're a bit of a unicorn in a lot of ways, right? What you've been through, the success you've been able to achieve, but most importantly, just the, the passion you found for what you do, right? You, you, you mentor a lot of people, you inspire people, we've been on panels together. There's a lot of people listening to this now in the future, Ari, that they don't know what their passion is. And they might be 14 and they might be 40. And they don't know what their passion is. And I see that a lot right now where people will be in something for 12 months and then they'll puddle jump to somewhere else and they'll change industries and they never get past that. And I'm a firm, I'm a personally a firm believer that the only way you get to the next level is by making your way through the struggle. But I see right now a lot with Gen Z, with, with, with earlier millennials, later millennials, um, myself being one of them, I see people not knowing what their passion is. So my question for you is when you're mentoring people and they're like, Ari, that's great. You're so inspirational. Where do I find my passion? How do I find my passion? So can you give any thoughts or advice on that? Because I think you had a moment in your career, right? Where you found that breakthrough. A lot of people haven't found that breakthrough yet. So I want to know what it felt like, but more importantly, how do you chase it if you know what your passion is? Well, you know, I listen, it's something I think about. Um, you know, I think about it a lot for, for, for one major reason. What I feel, I'm, I have two young kids. My daughter's five, my son's three. And at the time it's recording. And, and I, I think that I will be, I will consider myself a great parent if I can help my kids find what they're passionate about and what they want to do. And as long as it's, you know, legal and good, that I'm going to have the strength and the willingness to support them in that endeavor, even though it might be something I don't have the same passion about. That, that's what I think about. And so how can I help them find their passion when I can't get in there and do it for them, right? What, what do I do to be that supportive stroke? So something I've been thinking about a lot. And what I've just come down to, I think, Pete, is experiment, experiment, experiment. Try, try, try. And, you know, it's something like, you know, how do you know what love is? If you're looking for love, how do you know what love is? How do you find love? You just keep dating until you find it. And I think here's the thing. How did I find my passion for technology? Somebody brought me a computer. I dove into it and I was like really into it. It came easy to me. I was good at it. I kept wanting more, more, more. It never felt like work. It was one of those things where I'd sit down at the computer. I'd be like, I just, my mom'd be like, hey, we're having dinner in like an hour. And I'd be like, all right. And then what I thought was 10 minutes later, she's like, you're late for dinner. I'm like, what do you mean? And I would look down and it'd been an hour and a half. You're in a flow state. It was like, boom. Yeah, flow state. And, and so I think, you know, and the same thing about love, like, you know, I thought I knew what love is because I was like, oh, is it kind of like this? Is it kind of like that? And you know what? When I met my wife, I realized I didn't have to ask all those questions because when I found it, I knew it. You got to send her that clip. That's a great and, uh, and I think, And I think that that's how it is with passion at work. When you find it, you know it. And I just got, I mean, you want to call it luck. You want to call it whatever, right? So, so here's, here, here's what's going to blow your mind. I think I was lucky that I had that accident because I'm not sure I would have found this passion. I could have been the world's most unhappy lawyer, playing a lot of extra rounds of golf, trying to find a way to make my life happy when I was super unhappy, because maybe I wouldn't have been able to go and find this technology thing. Maybe I wouldn't have been here in West Hartford to be at Plan B, to meet my wife, you know, that one day in July, all those years ago, right? Like, I think everything that happens to us, if we just keep moving forward, taking that next step, we can always look back and be like, man, my life wouldn't have been as good without that, no matter what it was, the best things or the worst things. For those of you that are not in Connecticut, Plan B is a restaurant 
Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. It's a burger bar. That's a very, very good call. Should probably uh, forgot that. We, uh, we'll, add, we'll, we'll add some love for Plan B, the restaurant and burger bar. Um, yes. The locations yeah. in the show notes to make sure that there is no confusion. Where our we is. should. And by the way, Plan B was like voted like best burger in the country like a few years ago. So, um, but yeah, sorry. Yep. Yeah, that's a very, hey, very. We're saving Ari from being canceled. We appreciate yes. that. <laughs> Yes, that's I had my right. My wife had a plan B. Yeah, that's <laughs> no context. <laughs> yes, context is important to everything. So anyway, Pete, I, I was kind of went round and round there, but I just think it's experimentation, and so I advise people to try, and that's why I think it's so important to do it. The younger you are, the easier it is. I'm not saying you can always do it, and I would never advise someone who's 40 and feels stuck to say, "Well, just be stuck because it's too late." It ain't never too late. It ain't yeah. never too late at any age. Um, I just yeah. think encourage it when you're young because you know. If you don't feel like you're in the right thing and you're 20, do something else. Yeah. And so I did the sales gig and did all that stuff. And, and you know, what's funny. I look back and all those experimentations, dude. So I've owned, I've owned a computer business that built computers. I owned a IT consulting firm when I was in high school. I owned a cell phone and pager store. I delivered newspapers. I've caddied uh, golf clubs. I, I hawked bubble gum. I've done car washes. Like I have done a lot of stuff. I work, ran an IT department. For somebody i worked for a bit of a summer at a law firm i tried to sell fire alarms one summer in high school at a place that basically should have been shut down and maybe probably was because i don't think it was legal what they were doing there but i have like tried all, i've done all this kind of stuff and i literally every single thing i've done things that were very successful things that that cell phone and pager store when i was on vacation my partner emptied the bank account and stole every cent we had I had to sell everything in the store down to the furniture, the yeah. cases and the spare parts to pay off our debt. Um, you know, and all of those things, all those shitty situations, all the great situations, all the great luck that I've had, all the bad stuff, all of those things have come together to put me in the position that I'm in to get me on this podcast with you guys. Um, you know, uh, and I, and I just look at it like that, you know, so one thing, Ari, I tell people all the time, I tell our clients this, I tell our teams this, um, actually, you and I were just coaching some students up at UConn where I'm an alumni from, but we were on one of the things, and I say this all the time, it's about taking the leap, right? I like to, I like to come up with things that are pretty simple. I'm a huge Jim Quick fan. You know, acronyms are things that people action and remember. So for me, I say, take a leap, right? You got to learn, you got to experiment, you got to act, and that's how you progress, right? Take the leap. You don't have to blow up your life and quit your job to start your side thing. You don't have to experiment with that, but you got to learn, you got to experiment, you got to take some action because you can't just sit there and scroll on your feet all day. And then that's how you get the progress. So for everybody here, clearly you saw Ari took some leaps in his life. Um, some of those worked out, some of those didn't, but more importantly, he's still leaping forward. He's still going from there. So Dave, I, I, also, I, I know, I, I know you're, I you're, just you're wanna, here, so. Yeah. I just want to add a little bit of, of, I don't believe that this podcast is just going to be for young people. So I don't, I think young is a state of mind, mm -hmm. right? If you're willing to learn, if you're willing to always be better, if you're willing to, um, to experiment with new passions, if you if you're willing to. Didn't I just read somewhere that age is a case of mind over matter? If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. Yeah. All right. I love that. I love that Ari's reading my stuff. This is like I, all I had to do is mention Microsoft, and I got Ari to read. It's like I, I've put out like 30 pieces of content in the past month, and he hasn't read any of them. I put out one post of the Microsoft logo, and Ari Santiago pays attention. Like and, and I know listen, my audience now. I'm I'm a man of hip hop of hip hop music and R and B, and there was a rapper back in the day that said age ain't nothing but a number. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I just say that because there's a lot of people right now that are finding themselves in their 40s and 50s and 60s that are unemployed, um, that are finding it very hard in the workplace to become employable because they're afraid of technology or because they haven't they don't want to learn something new. I think that everybody should take this incredible advice from Ari. Uh, and understand that there's there's a tremendous amount of opportunity if you're willing to listen to to a to try things, b to 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 do it with some level of effort to find out if it's if you're going to be passionate about it to do it with some some open mindedness, um, and and more importantly is I think the incredible thing is to overcome uh, obstacles to go through those obstacles. Ari, you're literally a, a fellow rhino rhino that crushes through wall after wall after wall, but also uh, the ability to, to, to believe, the ability to 
to, to, see, to see past everything. I think it's just so critical. So I, I just want to say that's for everybody. It's not just young people. I think everybody has the ability to pivot. I'm hearing right now people starting their own companies at 50 years old, 40 years old. I love the story. New CEOs, retired people starting companies, you know, mothers and, and, and new fathers starting companies and doing things. So it's, that's for everybody. Absolutely. Now, Listen, experience, experience, Trumps, you know, I mean, listen, I'm, I, 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 I love sports uh, much as many people do. And, you know, what do you see? You know, the Michael Jordan that was at the end of his career uh, versus the Michael Jordan at the beginning. He obviously couldn't, you know, couldn't dunk as hard, got out of those dunk contests because of his knees and all that. But he was just as deadly in terms of putting points on the board, you know, and winning games. And I think we see that over and over again with athletes, whether it's LeBron or Tom Brady or whatever, you know, they're different later but they're just as deadly. And in many cases, deadlier, you know, like, because you, and when you're young and I'm no exception to this, when I was in my twenties, I wasted a lot of energy. Now, thank God I had a lot more energy, but I wasted a lot of it doing the wrong things. Now with so much more experience behind me from the experimenting, the trying and learning from those things, you know, I'm able to do, to do be much more effective with a lot less energy. So I agree with you, David. I think people that are later in life, they have a lot of advantages over young people and they should absolutely, everyone deserves to be happy. No matter how old we are, how young we are, no matter how many good decisions or bad decisions we made, it is absolutely never too late. Um, and yes. I think uh, right. that's, the, that's the key. I want right, so to take you to a happy moment real quick. Your first big contract you landed, if I recall correctly, from our uh, pre-podcast conversation, you landed a data project for UConn, right? But yeah. you were expecting to win that. Tell me about that. We, you know, something we, uh, we, we there was the, uh, it was the data data network at uh, Rensselaer Field, um, you know, in uh, in East Hartford, and uh, they were building the network, and there was like I was doing the work for a business that was kind of on in the same place as the people that were running that. Um, and I was in the data closet outside the conference room and I knew these guys, you know, again, you know how opportunity finds yourself, you just put yourself out there. So I would go places when I would be kind of doing my work and I would always talk to people, tell them what I was doing, ask them how they're doing, kind of bring them any value, you know, like, hey, do you need anything? Do you need anything? Do you need anything? Um, so I developed these relationships and, you know, just kind of joke around with them, whatever. So anyway, I'm in the data closet doing whatever, right? I mean, so, you know, this is like probably the first or second year of the business and there is a heated conversation in this conference room. I mean, I don't remember exactly what they were saying, but I mean, there was definitely loud voices, probably some cussing door flies open. And I like look over and Spiel Marshall and one of the guys comes to me and he's like, Ari, if we gave you the data network at UConn, could you do it? And I was like, yes, I didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. I literally did what UConn, what? Like, I don't even know. And he was like, and, and, he, and he was like, I knew it. And they just like walked away. And I was like, sweet. So am I doing it? Like, I'm not really sure what just happened right there. Um, and so then like a little while later, you know, I'm like, should I find out? Like, I'm like, kind of like done, but I'm just like staying, comes back down. And he was like, were you serious? And I'm like, were you serious? <laughs> and, uh, and he was like, I could be. And I'm like, then yes, I am. What do I have to do, you know? And, you know, we sort of sat down we talked about it, you know, kind of went through the process, whatever. And we, and we got that, and we got that job. And, you know, listen, I'll be honest. I didn't initially, I looked at the scope. I'm like, this is bigger than anything I've ever done before. And I can't, I can't fuck this up, right? Like I got to execute, I got to execute. And so what do you do when you have some this huge opportunity that's on your plate, but you don't know how to execute? Figure Find somebody out. who does. Yeah. Find somebody who does. And so I knew a guy who had like built, like, you know, um, everyone knows cable internet now, but back then it wasn't so big. He used to get flown around by like AT&T, who was like precursor to Comcast, building out these data networks, these cable networks all over the country. And I called him and I was like, yo, I got this opportunity. And we looked at it and he was like, um, yeah, I'll do it, but we got to go in partners 50-50. And uh, I was like, on this one project, I mean, it was significant money, but I was like, let's do it. Why? Because I'm not trying to win today. I'm trying to win the long game. And it was worth it to me to get the experience, to get in there, to do the job. And then that's under my belt, right? And now I've got it. And I did it. And like, boom, springboard. And then every time I went to a company and they'd be like, well, you know, we've got 50 employees and you guys only have three. And I'd be like, no, I totally get it. If I was in your shoes, I'm sure I'd be worried about my company too. But have you heard of a 
the UConn football team, you know, they just went to Division One, and they're like, yeah. I mean, you know, they have that big football stadium, and they're like, yeah. I'm like, you know, we built that entire stadium. My guess is that if we could build a network with like 1,600 data ports that integrates ESPN, the state of Connecticut, the Connecticut State Police, the luxury networks, all the boxes, that we could probably take care of your like 50-person office. And they'd be like, yeah, probably. And I use that calling card over and over and over again. But if I had been the one to be like, well, I'm not going to give up this short-term big win, you know, and like partnering on that thing probably cost me 40, 50 grand. A lot of people make Small is the new big, man. Small is the new big. A lot of people go for the whole grape instead of 10% of the watermelon. Dude, like that's it. And, and, and you just got to believe. You got to believe. And, uh, you know, it's just keeping on looking at the end. I just want to go back to one thing because there's this book called The Dip. I don't know if you've ever read The Dip. But it just talks about how every time we start something new, and we all know these people, right? Every time you talk to them, they're starting a new career. They're going back to school. They're changing jobs. Like, right? It's always the next new thing. And I think that, you know, there's – this is a hard thing to figure out. And I don't know that I have the answer, but it's something worth talking about, which is – Everything you, most everything that we start in the beginning is exciting, right? Because you have that like beginner's enthusiasm. You don't know what's going on. Everything's easy right in the beginning, right? Beginner's luck, right? Everything's kind of happening. You're all juiced up. But without fail, no matter what it is, even the things that we love, and this is certainly true for me in business, we hit that dip, right? We get past that initial curve and the shit gets hard fast. And then there's that like slog you got to get through to get to the other side of that dip. And when you figure it out and you get through the slog and you bounce to the other side, the whole world is still on the other side of that dip and they look across and they're like, I don't know how anyone got over there, but oh my God, they're so amazing. You know, and I was talking about the basketball players earlier. Everyone looks at like whether it's LeBron or Michael Jordan or whatever, Tom Brady's no exception. And they see what they do on game day, but they don't know every single day coming in, shooting 500, you know, jump shots a day, 600 free throws a day, Tom ice Brady bath. going every single ice summer, bath. ice bath. Yeah. The whole thing. And, and so what's really hard, and this is the part I wanted to talk about, is how do you know when the dip is worth it for you? If it's always going to get hard, how do you know when it's the right hard to get to the other side? And I'll throw out my idea on it, and I'll let you guys kind of opine if you think I'm in the, in the ballpark. But this is the best I've been able to come up with is I kind of do the alarm clock test, you know? Like when I get up in the morning – Am I hitting snooze over and over again and just waiting for the weekend because I hate Monday, Tuesday? Or when the weekend comes, am I pumped for Monday because I just want to hit it again and get back at it? And I think that's the test. You know, I assume that when LeBron goes in there to hit those free throws and take those jumpers, it's because he loves taking jumpers. And yeah, it sucks and you get sore and you do the ice bath and that part's tough, but you love the jumpers. And I think that's what it is, but I don't know what you guys think. Ari, I picture you every morning doing the LeBron with the powder and going like this. (laughs) <laughs> like, let's get the day going. I love it. Uh, so, no, I agree. I, I, I agree with you. Listen, I, I can't tell you the last time that I hit snooze on my alarm clock. I can't tell you the last time that I woke up and was like, shit, I'm going to sleep till, till I want to sleep till 10. Uh, you know, it's like, I love, I love what I do. I, I think the, a true entrepreneur and, and loves the, the roller coaster. We talk about it in the intro to this podcast. Uh, you know, business is a roller coaster. You got to strap in, but the only direction that roller coasters, for the most part, go or forward. I think that you really have to love and truly respect. At least you don't need to love the downs, but you have to respect the downs. You have to understand the downs. You have to be prepared for the downs. You have to know and anticipate the downs because if you could do that, you wake up every single morning and you're ready to go. And maybe yeah. once in a while, I, 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 like I said in the beginning, uh, earlier in this podcast, every once in a while, there's one day where you wake up and you're just like, holy shit. But everybody, I, I feel like you get one of those a quarter. I don't know if you believe in the same. One a quarter where you just wake up and you're just like, fuck everybody. <laughs> I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> so, you know, it's funny. I, don't, I, I, I agree with you except for one thing. Okay. Those days, I want to hit it harder. Okay. You know, like, like I, you know, we just, we just, you know, we, we have this new thing, this new thing we started a couple of years ago with my wife where we, we, um, I, we agree to three vacations a year. They're usually about a week each. And when I go, I'm gone. My alerts are off. My shit's down. I got, I got no IMs, no email, no nothing. My text message is up. And the deal is, you know, if there's an emergency, don't call. The building's on fire. Call the fire department they'll take care of it. Mm-hmm. If after that, there's like something really, really bad, shoot me a text, you know, but like I'm, I'm out. 
Um, but I will say every once in a while, it just happened just a week or so ago, we left and there's this one thing I didn't get done. And that's going to be on my mind the whole time. And I was like, babe, I'm sorry. I'm just going to jump on. I'm going to spend like 45 minutes on this one thing and then I'm out, you know? And for me, that's it. Like on those tough times, I just want to get in there and like make it happen um, and, and, and hit it harder. But there are definitely days that suck. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's for, that's for damn sure. Here's my thoughts on this, right? So essentially like you're talking about what MBAs talk about all the time with the S curve, right? You talk about the dip. Great book, by the way. Um, one thing that really bothers me, and I see this a lot, especially in social media, I saw it pre COVID. I'm seeing it a lot more now with COVID is everyone wants that Instagram life. Everyone wants that sort of perfect photo, that perfect moment, that perfect vacation, perfect, perfect, perfect. And I'm going to just come out and say it because this is not a podcast about hustle porn. This is a com uh, this is a podcast about progress and it's a progress about moving forward. I think people are intellectually obese and lazy. I think Ooh. that they consume and they consume and they consume and they consume and then they make it maybe one S curve cycle and they're not in that perfect photo on Instagram and they don't realize not enough that. likes happen. Yeah. Wow. Dude, I honestly I'm super I'm super into that. I, yeah. I like that intellectually obese. I, you gotta trademark that. Yeah, no, That's no, no. A, that and the whole like like the likes of life. Like it, you, I think you hit on something there that you need to, you need to write a, on your next article should be the likes of life. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I do not. I, I, that's just, it's a great way to think about it. It's all consumption, no action. And it's the same thing with eating. I think intellectually obese is like, wow, that's going to, that is going to stick with me. Well, it's I'm, kinda like, it's like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm make mental note going to go trademark that thing before you do. Um, <laughs> no, but, uh, it's on record right here. TF. <laughs> I'm going to hack that. I'm going to hack that shit and delete it. I got you, boy. Uh, Kanye, um, by the way, uh, Kanye said it best, but you know, I'm going to let you. Oh, no, we're going to uh, quote Kanye. Uh-oh, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you finish, but, um, but I, I, I wrote about intellectual obesity four years ago. Um, so Ari, clearly all I gotta do is put a Microsoft logo up. It's like the bat signal for Ari. The Microsoft uh, logo I've read, logo. I've read all your content. That article just came out today. So no, I, uh, I remembered it. No, the, no, uh, no, no listen, I, I just, I think that, I think you're right. And, um, and I think people don't want to put in the work, dude. And I commented earlier about, you know, being fit and looking good, which goes back to the whole Instagram thing. And, um, were we, was, was this, were we talking about the, the, we, oh, we were talking about earlier, the rock on ballers. And like everyone thinks that that's how you can just like that, that you can look like the rock and act like he does on ballers instead of realizing that how he is on ballers is an act. And if he acted like he did on ballers, he wouldn't look like how he looks in real life. Um, and I think that, and I think that that's kind of the mistake people have on, on, you know, on all that stuff is they think that how do you get there? Uh, it's just all hard work, man. And, and, and that's by the way, just to go kind of go back. And I know we said it's a hustle porn and I'm, I'm not trying to do that, but I am going to say this anything in life worth having is hard work. And by the way, that's health, physical health, mental health, marriage, and your work and your job is absolutely no different. And if anyone thinks that you can go through it and just like half-ass it or get pose on pictures and post and count your likes and that's success, you're done. Yeah. And uh, we, need, we, need to, we need to kind of get through that. No doubt, man. I would just say, you know, if, like when I think about that and I abstract that, you know, the one thing I want to just also put out there is like, listen, struggle is struggle. Like I've had mental health challenges. Like people, the other day, somebody asked me, they, they were just a, a colleague of mine was like, you know, Pete, like, you know, I love all the positive stuff you're putting out all the time. Like you're always so positive, you're always so positive, blah, blah, blah. You know, like, how do you do it? And I said, I scream in private. Like, and they're like, what? And like, I scream in private. I'm like, I grab the pillow. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? You know, like, yeah, I'm not going to do that on an Instagram post. I'm not going to do that on my, my content, but I scream in private or I pick up the phone call Dave, which is usually like, Dave's like my, like, you know, who wants to be a millionaire phone call. It's like, Dave, what the fuck am I doing? Phone a friend. <laughs> He's my phone a friend. He talks me off the ledge. But you that. just, you gotta, you just gotta keep on going. You know what I mean? And, and, and listen, you know, they say that the act of smiling makes you happy. And it's I think, true. and I think sometimes you got to do the next action because the next action is the thing that's going to make you feel, you know, satisfied. And I mean, now we're going to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole here, but I was going to say, you know, in lifetime management, in my view, and prioritization of activities is key to happiness. Because if you, if you can spend every day and every morning, at least get one really important thing done, really, oh, not, oh, not fake important, but a real important thing, just one every single day, 
you know, it's, it's, it's like our podcast. It's like the pod, my Made in America podcast. You know, I said, we are going to release an episode every week, come hell or high water. And we've done it every single week. Sometimes we did two during the early stages of COVID. And you know, all of a sudden you look back and you're a year plus past and you're like, holy crap, look at all that we've done. And the same is true in your life. If you can just do that, like one good thing, if you make it a point to do one really important thing every day, all of a sudden you look back two weeks, a month, six months, six years, 10 years later. And you're like, holy crap, how far have I come? Did I think that I'd have a company the size that I had? I mean, I guess I hoped, I believed, I think we're going to get a lot bigger. But like, I thought that when we were like two people mm. and we just had to do the acts, take a step, take a step, take a step, take a step and get there. There are no shortcuts, man. Ari, this is awesome. I want to ask you one. So you, we talk about progress, pitfalls, and pivots. You've literally hit on all of those things. One thing that I like to talk about is aha moments. If you could, if, if you could sum up one aha moment that really is profound in your career, what is it? In my career. So this is work-related aha moment. I, I got it. Wait, it listen. That's all right. Well, I, I got one. I'm going to stick to that. I'm going to stick. I'm going to stick to that for right now because I got one, and I'm going to. I'm going to roll with it. But I also so, think aha moments, life, life, life moments can be across all boards. So you, you take it wherever you want. Well, I mean, I told you about the one with my dad in the hospital. That was a very big, you know, life aha moment. Uh, meeting my wife was a big life aha moment. Um, you know, those are two biggest ones. Um, but, I, you know, career-wise, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll share this one. Um, you know, I was started, I started IT Direct in, you know, 2002 and worked hard. You heard about the success of Rensselaer Field. But, you know, we – we, we kind of plateaued pretty quickly. You know, I had a spreadsheet, speaking of Microsoft, I remember the, about 18 months in, land that deal, da, 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 da. I'm like, man, the way we're going, if I can just do this for 10 more years, we're going to be bigger than Microsoft. That did not happen. Um, and so, uh, so it didn't happen. And years later, I ended up uh, about 2009 at a, um, maybe late 2008, um, I ended up at an entrepreneur's organization event, eonetwork.org. Huge, huge influence in my life. Uh, has helped me innumerably. We didn't get to it, but I, anyone should look it up. If you're in business and you want to be a great business person, join and learn. It's absolutely unbelievable. Um, so I went to an event, and I'll, I'll never forget this. It was at Salute in Hartford. And we're in the back room. And I do, so in this place, I, I knew why I had plateaued. I was still making good money, six figures and all that stuff, but working really, really hard and not able to like kind of get over it. I feel like every year it's doing a little bit better, but working a lot more and every, you know, and you know, that kind of deal, that kind of like slogging entrepreneur, almost like seven days a week, like blah, blah, blah. So I go to this thing and we're in the back room and the guy says, how many people in this room think they make good living? So everybody raises their hand and uh, including myself. And he said, all right, well, write down on this paper in front of you, how much you made in the last year. So I write down the number. And he's like, how many days a week do you work? Write that down. So write that down. On average, how many hours do you work every day? So I write that down. Do that math. So how many hours? So how many weeks do you work in the year? So you write that down. Now do that math. So now I got the hours I've worked in the year. He's like, now take the amount you made and divide it by the hours. You're going to get a number. And I want you to find that number on this chart puts up a chart on the screen and the top was like Bill Gates was like a million dollars a minute or whatever. And the very bottom was like server below minimum wage pre tips. And I find myself just below a fast food restaurant supervisor on hourly rate. And I know in my heart that this hour, that my money is more but my hourly rate, hourly rate is worse than it was two or three years ago. Think about that crashing moment in an entrepreneur's life when he realizes the path he's on is a path to certain doom. And that everything I've said about family being the most important thing, that was never happening. I barely had enough time to do anything besides work and work out, like, and barely work out. You know, like, this life wasn't going where I wanted it. Everything, in that moment, everything that I believed and said, I realized, was an inadvertent lie. It was never happening with the path that I was on. And I had to change everything. Wow. And so I did. I said, I don't know what I need to know to make this journey happen. So I joined EO and I said, I am going to do whatever they say. They say, read this book. I'm going to read that book. And I'm going to find a way to implement something Not I learned. one chapter, right? But you finished nope. the whole book. They said, go to this event. I went to the event. I tried to find something. I would try and implement. They said, join the board. I joined the board. They said, we got an event in Mexico. I went to Mexico. Whatever. I just did it. 
Do and I just, little by little, I learned. And I, I learned wrong, and I tried to implement 17 things at once when you should only do one. Like, I, I even implemented the learnings wrong, but I just kept learning, kept learning, kept leaping, kept leaping, kept leaping. And you know what? Here we are about 11 years later. My company's 15 times bigger than it was when I started that part of my journey. I'm having 100 times more fun, more profitable, driving way more value to clients. How, just, it's like, my le- everything is better. All, everything I wanted came true because I made the decision to make an impact and make a difference. And I had to start with myself. All right, we're gonna end it on that note. That You are fucking incredible, man. You, this was better than I had anticipated. Um, I wanna thank you for coming on. I wanna thank you for being vulnerable, for telling us all, all the, all, getting into all the, the, the nooks and crannies of your story. Um, and really bringing us personally, like I, 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 I have grown, I was in awe of you when I met you and your personality and your energy. I'm even more so now. We copied this from the Hot Wings show. You got to look at this camera, this camera, this camera. How do people follow you? Tell us about IT Direct and your podcast. Sure. Uh, Ari Santiago, best thing to do is follow me. Uh, look for me up on uh, LinkedIn, Ari Santiago. So check that out, IT Direct. Uh, IT Direct is a uh, technology solutions provider that helps uh, small and mid-sized businesses leverage technology to reach their business goals. And I have my own podcast, Made in America with Ari Santiago, where we highlight Connecticut manufacturers and the tremendous things that manufacturing means to Connecticut and what we're doing. So hopefully uh, people got value out of this. That's my goal. Uh, engage, follow me, and hopefully we can do something to help each other. Awesome. awesome. Ari, you are the man, brother. Thanks so much. That's a wrap.